Hey students, Eric Magidson here. So, so let's take a look at lesson four, working with disks and, and devices. And, and although we're focused on the client, the Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, it's all gonna be sort of the same thing in this aspect. Um, I do wanna bring into play and talk a little bit about disks and devices and, and certainly you know, the advent and, and the standardization that we're seeing as it pertains to solid state drives now. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start with just understanding what a device driver is. So, you know, we all by now should know it's, it, it's simply nothing more than, than a piece of software that allows, you know, called a device driver that allows a peripheral device or even a device inside the computer to communicate with the operating system. So, of course, you know, standardly, if we're running Mac, we're going to need a driver that's specific for Mac and the hardware um, and the operating system. If we're running PC, uh, we certainly are going to find that, you know, maybe my old HP printer that ran on Windows 8 um, had a driver, but I need a specific driver, a new driver for it to run uh, as efficiently in Windows 10. You know, because there's changes in the operating system that that may affect it. So. You know, one of the great things with device drivers, some of you might be familiar with Windows XP back in that day, real challenge to do device drivers because today, a lot of the device drivers are built into the operating system. So that's why the operating system that used to fit on a CD uh, now has to be on a DVD for us to install it because there's a ton of drivers that Microsoft is including so that the experience of loading and configuring the operating system really becomes seamless or or plug and play so you know that term plug and play the idea that well here i'm i'm speaking in a you know in an at2020 microphone well i just plugged it in and amazingly the operating system knew that it had a compatible driver now what i found is that the driver was a standard microsoft recordable driver so consequently, was there benefit to go out? It seemed to work. Was there benefit to go out to AT2020 uh, website and get the driver? I always do that. We'll talk more about that later. But so back to XP, in the XP days, you'd install the operating system and literally you'd have to go to another computer and get the driver for the network interface card many times that was in the computer because the operating system didn't recognize it. So you'd go into device manager, you'd see all the you know, the yellow uh, exclamation marks. Hey, I've got this hardware, but I don't have a driver for it. So give me a driver so I can run. As Microsoft updated their operating systems, that became more seamless. And now with Windows 8, you can literally almost install Windows 8 onto a, onto a new computer, um, many times even a home-built computer, and have it recognize all the devices uh, in the computer. So... So understanding, you know, major part of Windows 8 installation process, identifying the devices in the computer and installing the appropriate drivers. Yeah. So if a, if, if a device is not working correctly, the first thing I do is go out and make sure, did it get installed with a Microsoft compatible driver or did it find the manufacturer's driver? So Microsoft does drivers that are compatible drivers and then they'll go out and accept uh, certified or what's called sign drivers from manufacturers to include as well to make that that installation and configuration process seamless so you know of course yes virtually every component in a PC requires a device driver this includes by the way the motherboard you know and other devices the, the USB device for example on a motherboard uh, video cards, network interface cards, you name it, they all need devices. So I'll have an alternate video where we go in and <coughs> look at uh, device drivers. So this is just the lecture here. So they do vary in complexity. You know, sometimes a driver is just a couple K in size. Sometimes it's a mega, you know, megabytes in size because they're including additional functionality, additional software. A great example would be a printer you know you get an HP printer and, and that driver is going to be a hundred two hundred meg in size because it's not just giving you the information or the software that allows the operating system to communicate with it but also that driver includes you know software that's designed for how you print what you're printing to stuff like that so you know keep in mind that doesn't make it all the driver 
It's just they make it seamless for the end user. So, you know, graphics adapters, self-contained computers in themselves. Well, yeah, their own processor and memory. They need specific drivers. So when we talk about drivers, we need to create because remember, we're not talking about a one-off computer. We're talking about managing the Windows client, managing 500 to 1,000 to thousands of these clients. So, you know, keeping up with drivers for all devices can be difficult. <laughs> My policy was just because a new driver comes out doesn't mean I need to install it. If it's functioning fine with the old driver and there's not a security risk associated with the old driver, let's be clear on that, then why not run with the old driver? What I can do is then have an update policy that says, all right, um, you know, if I'm using a lifecycle policy for my computers, hopefully I, I have four or five models of computers because each year I buy a percentage of new computers and replace the oldest ones. So what I might do at that point is I'm going to have to manage five models. The drivers are going to be different for each model. I may choose what I did uh, in the corporate environment is if we had problems with the driver, we went ahead and installed the updates, you know, as needed. But most of the time, as we re-image computers, usually once a year, um, we took that master image, we installed the latest drivers, we used that master image in some beta testing out to um, some power users in each department because each department had their own unique software, their own unique hardware. Um, they tested it and then we would deploy it out to their apartment departments. So, you know, it says right there, a te uh, test all driver updates before deploying them, especially in an enterprise environment. You bet. If you're deploying a driver out to say a thousand computers and it crashes that computer or makes whatever hardware device suddenly unfunctional, you just created a whole heck of a lot of work for your department. So test them, test them again. Um, the initial testing should be done by the IT department, and then again, you could do sort of a beta test by implementing that out to specific machines that you know will be affected by the update. So, so here's that idea that I mentioned about driver signing. So a signed driver is a device driver that includes a digital signature. Um, what this means is we know that this software, this driver, is the certified driver that's coming from either Microsoft or the manufacturer. It has a checksum, so we know that by getting signed drivers versus just going out to the web and saying, hey, give me a driver for this, um, that can be very risky because that driver may have been changed, adding in malware, adding in some other components that you don't want. So, you know, the idea behind driver signing is, is actually a good idea. However, for a lot of us, there's the issue of, well, okay, a driver isn't signed, okay? And... What Microsoft now does is you know, they give us the screen. Hey, you're about to install an unsigned driver. We can't do this, you know. So one of the design imperatives of Windows 8 is faster booting. So depending on the system hardware, the interval, interval uh, during which a user can press the F8 key, you know, is is minimized, right? Uh, you know, different methods. So what we do is if we don't have a signed driver we actually have to go through a separate policy going into it you know access the advanced boots options and do this to um to install that driver now i'll be honest what a lot of techs do and what i do with my own personal computer is i go in and turn off that requirement you know of of signed drivers so that way it's it's efficient I can install the drivers that I know. And because I'm an IT professional, this works for me. Realize that where this idea of signed drivers is coming from is for that end user who may not be aware of the fact that, that a driver can, you know, is a great place to inject malware, inject viruses, inject security vulnerabilities into a computer. So, so this just walks you through, you know, the advanced options, you know, accessing those advanced options uh, to get to where you know, we install the uh, the device driver. So some screenshots there, you know, things we can do. If, if we're programming a driver, we want to manually change it, you know, um, we can enable debugging, we can enable boot logging. A lot of times, folks, you'll get a driver, you have challenges with it, you need to call technical support. They're going to have you go through the uh, some of these steps 
you know, like boot logging to see how the driver reacts um, as the system boots up, you know, or as, as the device is used. So working with devices, yeah, you know, most PCs now, USB, <laughs> a lot of PCs come with both USB 2.0 so that they can support 2.0 devices and 3.0. 3.0 um, plugs tend to be uh, a lot of times backward compatible, but of course uh, 2.0 can't uh, support 3.0. So we've talked about that idea of plug and play and it holds true. Pretty simple, we just plug it in, Windows 8 finds the driver, it detects it, it automatically installs it, and it just works. So that's what we hope, but remember, it's going to do that based on, perhaps based on a Microsoft, um, a Microsoft driver. So here you see an example with printer. You know, there's MS Publisher Color Printer. All right. So you know, is that is that a printer? Well, it's MS Publisher. So it's a print device used with MS Publisher. So if we need, you know, we can certainly, you know, go into devices, choose new devices. Um, you know, to install at that point, we can get the model, we can go out. I always recommend going out and getting the latest driver that's available, you know, the most current driver you could say that's available. That way I know if there were any previous security vulnerabilities, I'm not going to get stuck um, in a position of vulnerability of installing something that may not be most current. Of course, this also comes with doing some research. OK, so do some research, call up that driver in Google. Are people on forums having challenges installing it or challenges once they install it? Is it perhaps that it works on an HP, but it doesn't work on a Dell? A lot of times, folks, you need to also remember that one of the best places to get drivers, especially for devices that are inside the computer already, is out at the manufacturer. You know, just because your computer has an NVIDIA video card XYZ PDQ doesn't mean that Dell hasn't changed the configuration on that video card to better work with their configuration on their computer. So, uh, you know, during installation, yeah, we can install drivers. This becomes pretty important. This where, is where I want to take a little side trip by saying one of the main drivers that we may have to install prior to the installation of Windows 8 or Windows Server would be a driver for the RAID controller card. So a lot of times today, you know, we are creating high-end desktops where we're installing RAID either for the speed of mirroring or the, uh, you know, parity so that if we lose one drive, the computer can still run. We see this a lot, especially with drafting computers, where having a drafting computer down because the hard drive failed is just not economical. It's, it just doesn't provide a solid return on investment. So you gamers certainly understand what I mean. You know, you'll put multiple drives, even multiple solid state drives into the computer to speed up its performance. So, um, so we can install at installation. An example of that would be a RAID controller driver. We can also go out and, you know, create, um, we can create, batch files that contain updated drivers, or we can install the operating system, then update the drivers. So there's a lot of ways for us to get drivers into the system. So one of the most, I guess you might say, seamless ways to get drivers is simply to use the Windows Update. I'm sure you all you know, have are familiar with Windows Update. You're running it. There could be the fact that you've reconfigured Windows Update. Instead of automatically installing updates to your computer, you want to be notified and choose which updates you want to install. I do always recommend, especially for retail. Now, Windows Update in an enterprise environment, absolutely not. You know, In my humble opinion, never set it to automatically update drivers. Because again, what if you get a driver that kills 2,000 computers, right? So we do have either third-party tools, we've got Windows Software Update Services that we can use where we can pull down one driver uh, for a specific model to a server and then deploy it in a test environment or deploy it out to some beta testers and then finally deploy it out to all the computers that are affected. So 
But you know, with Windows Update, yes, Windows Update does do drivers in the driver library. These can be Microsoft standardized drivers. These can also be drivers that have been um, given to Microsoft to put in their update library from third party manufacturers. So definitely something to look at. So device manager, again, like I said, I'll have a, another video where we can go in and kind of discover this. I'll uninstall a driver. We'll see what happens, how we reinstall a driver, where we can go and do that. So, you know, a lot of times today when we install a driver, we simply go out and get that executable, run it. It knows how to install itself. Um, but we can certainly go into the device drivers, we'll see, and ask, does Windows Update have an updated driver? Or can they find one on the web? So device manager, you know, get information about devices that are installed. Here's a quick screenshot for you. You'll play with this in the lab too. So as you can see, here's, you know, here's a computer, right? And we have drivers for disk drives and display adapters and DVD, CD-ROMs. Heck, even floppy drives if your computer still has one. Uh, you know, mice, monitors, ports on the computer. That's where we'd find like the USB, etc. So one of the tabs is to look at the properties, um, you know, devices by type, by connection. So, you know, are we using an IRQ for this that's um, that's not working on a certain channel, etc. You know, we can look at resources by type or by connection. And basically what that means is we just you know, continue to drill down and then look at the properties. So we can go in and let's, so here, you know, we're highlighted on the uh, ACPI X64 base PC, you know, so if you notice there's that Microsoft compliance system, we go in and we can look at the detailed properties of that, you know, seeing a lot more information, you know, the channel it's running on, you know, what it's using, what else might be affected, what IRQs are there, is there any IO, um, you know, everything about the device. So this gives us an idea. Now, you know, sometimes we'll get this in hexadecimal and, um, you know, difficult to read, but realize what most of the time, if I'm having an issue with a device, first place I'm going to go is Google. I'm going to make sure I Google the right model number and then the the model number for the device, the model number for the computer I'm installing it in. So, you know, device manager's property sheet, you know, we get a general tab. We can look at the driver and update the driver. We can get details. We can look at events, you know, and the resources it's used. So a lot of times, you know, it's great to go out and look at those events, see if there's an event ID that we can Google to figure out what might be the problem. So, you know, often funny to me, you, you pull this up, you pull up a device properties, and it says the device is working properly, but guess what? It's not, all right? So again, where do we go? Well, it's pretty simple. We go out to Google, and we get the answer. We can both enable and disable devices. As we'll learn further on, the, the best place to disable it, uh, devices, um, if we're doing it from a security standpoint, is in a mechanism called the Group Policy Management. So GPO, a group policy object, because that way we're not just affecting one computer, but we can affect all the computers with the same change. And today, folks, it is not uncommon to find out that IT professionals are being asked to do things like turn off USB ports, um, turn off CD, DVD drives so that people can't copy data that they shouldn't have and take it home with them or share it with competitors. So... Um, you know, security is, is becoming a huge deal. A lot of companies now are realizing a lot of the security vulnerabilities that are happening are happening inside the company. This isn't a black hat hacker, you know, breaking through the firewall, you know, and doing that kind of thing. So a lot of vulnerability come from inside the organization. So device manager, you know, you can disable any advice, uh, device in the computer. You know, select the device, right click, open. Again, we'll look at this in the other video. Updating drivers, you know, when to update the driver? Well, again, that's entirely up to you. But the fact is, is the driver functioning? Are there security risks to the current version of the driver? Um, you know, do I really need to install it? Or is this something that I can sort of service pack, 
you know, when I'm ready to re-image or refresh my computers, um, can I install the driver? A lot of times what we find is, you know, there's also third-party software that allows us to manage hardware, um, manage software, manage changes, and we can deploy drivers through that out to, again, thousands of computers once it's tested. So, but inside the device manager, you know, we can say, you know, right click and update driver and it'll go out and search the web or if I've downloaded the driver, great. Um, my best practice is I don't tend to search the web. I'm not really sure where it's going, what it's getting. Yes, I know it's going to Windows Update and asking first, hey, is there a driver? Um, so what I tend to do is I have the driver and if I need to from here, I go to browse my computer and I install the driver that I know came from either the manufacturer of the, of the device or from the manufacturer of my computer that supports the device. So, you know, again, we can update by browsing, finding the driver. There is the chance that sometimes you install drivers and it breaks something. So what we can do at that point is to basically roll back to the old driver, you know, to solve the problem, we can roll back versus having to install the old driver. So Windows 8 makes this possible with the rollback feature, which you initiate by clicking the rollback driver button and the driver tab of the device property sheet, and it goes back to the old version. So troubleshooting drivers, you know, yeah, here's a whole, you know, thing, open the properties, open the device manager, delete the device entirely, restart the computer. Yep, those are all things you can do. My suggestion would be start with a Google search. Figure out what other users are experiencing. Is it the driver? Will deleting the device and having the computer reinstall the device fix the problem? So um, again, research, research, research. Um, it's kind of funny. Sometimes the last computer to get fixed with little annoyances is my own personal computer, um, you know, as, as we manage corporate environments. So anyway, that uh, should get you started on the device driver. You'll play with these in the lab. There's the summary for you to go through. Have an awesome day.